This week on The Anxious Truth, we're going to answer a question. Can I recover from my anxiety disorder without doing exposure? Well, the answer is no, but it's not as easy as that. So let's get into it. Now, this is the part where I usually play some introduction music and do a little spiel, but this is the no music, no productions value, no frills, Drew just talking into a microphone version of The Anxious Truth because, well, sometimes I just kind of like it that way. And honestly, I'm super pressed for time. So this makes it really easy to produce. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'm sorry, there's no video this week, but you can still listen in. So before we get into this question, which is, can I recover from my anxiety disorder without exposure? Just a very quick reminder that the anxious truth is more than just this podcast episode, or there's YouTube video, there's a bunch of other resources centered on anxiety, anxiety disorders and anxiety recovery, that you can find on my website at the anxious truth.com the books that I've written the other podcast episodes, social media content, low cost workshops and seminars, go check it out. It's at the anxious truth.com. If you want to find a way to support the work that I'm doing, because you dig it, and you're using it, and you're finding it helpful, all the ways to do that are over there. So when you get a second, maybe pop on over there and check out my website. Again, that's the anxious truth.com. So that being said, let's get into today's episode. Can I recover without doing exposure? And the answer, in my clinical opinion, is no. But again, it's not as easy as that. First of all, why am I even addressing this question? Well, it's because I get asked the question on a regular basis. Why? Because there's content on social media platforms that seems to at least strongly suggest or imply that exposure is cruel or traumatizing, and that it simply is not necessary to overcome chronic or distorted states of anxiety. That's why people ask the question. That's why I'm doing this podcast episode today to answer the question, or at least give you my answer to the question. I'm always going to remind you when we do these things that everyone gets to pick their own path. If that means that you don't want to go down the exposure route, that is your right to make that choice. And it is not my place, or I think anybody else's place, to try to convince you to do otherwise. I'm just primarily interested in making sure that people make choices that are based on accurate information that also includes subtleties and nuances that often get missed when information is sort of passed around on social networks, which aren't really good at subtleties and nuances. So let's start by looking at what exposure is. This is going to be a simplified uh, uh, explanation for this podcast episode, but we kind of have to start there. Exposure is what we call it when we choose to come into contact with the things that we fear to intentionally feel that fear. Why do we do that? Well, in the old days of cognitive behavioral therapies, we would do it for habituation purposes. You get used to it. You jump in a cold swimming pool. It feels super cold. You want to jump out. But if you hang in there long enough, you get used to it. That's habituation. Did that work? Sure, it did. Did it work as consistently as we wanted it to? Not really. Were there relapses? Yeah, they kind of were. So now we do exposures to use principles of inhibitory learning. We do the exposures. We choose to not engage in the escape or safety rituals we usually insist we need. We learn that we wind up capable of handling the fear. And this means the internal experience of fear, how you feel and what you think without using those safety responses. And things change. Inhibit the saving response, learn from that experience, inhibitory learning. That's why we do exposures. And that's what exposures are. Again, grossly oversimplified. But for the purposes of this particular podcast episode, that'll get you where you need to be. Now, does this work? Honestly, it's not even a question at this point. We've been doing exposure based therapies and using exposure based therapies for decades now. And especially when we started combining exposure, which I also like to call behavioral experimentation or experiments, when we started combining exposure with acceptance and process based strategies, that's the third wave, rather than control and content based strategies, that's the old school second wave, things by and large go pretty well for a very large number of people. And we generally see good clinical outcomes that are longer lasting. It's a good thing. However, while we cannot argue that done well exposure works, there are knocks against exposure, and we have to really look at them. The first knock is that exposure causes a high attrition rate. People leave therapy early. Exposure is hard to do. Nobody wants to do scary things. So when therapy clients engage in exposure based therapies, there is a chance that they will bail out because of the process because of the difficulty involved in intentionally facing scary situations. Listen, this is a valid criticism. 
but where's the nuance? Well, when there is good preparation and psychoeducation before the exposure is done, that attrition rate does drop dramatically according to the data. But I'm not going to try to convince anyone that exposure is easy. And yes, when humans do difficult or disturbing things, they are at least somewhat likely to stop doing those things if it feels too hard to do. I get that. High attrition rate is a reasonable and valid criticism of exposure based therapies, no doubt. Here's the second one. This is the tough one. The second criticism is exposure is damaging or traumatizing. This is patently false. It just is. But let me clarify. In exposure based therapies, it is absolutely critical for the therapist or counselor to be well versed in the treatment they are using with their clients and able to look well beyond only the mechanics of exposure and what makes it effective. That is critical. Almost every therapy client I work with in my admittedly short and fledgling career as a therapist thus far has objections to exposure work. They find it difficult for reasons that are specific and unique to them. I could not simply repeat the principles of exposure to these people over and over by rote demand that they do exposure to get better and totally ignore the experiences and beliefs and culture they bring into the process. I have to know where they've been. I have to know what they've experienced. I have to take cultural and social issues into account. If, for example, a client has lived through actual experiences where maybe being in public places has been threatening or actually dangerous to them on a variety of levels, then simply telling them to face their fear or do it scared or do it anyway without taking that into account might actually be traumatizing or re-traumatizing in some way. That is true. But if I were to take that client and essentially force them to do, say, shopping mall or supermarket exposures, that's my fault. It's the fault of the clinician. That's not a flaw in the concept of exposure-based therapies. This is where sometimes when things get watered down and oversimplified in the endless scroll that is social media, we don't accurately address an issue from all the required angles, which it takes more than 30 seconds or a minute or 90 seconds to do. So with the right sensitivity, the right preparation, education, you encourage your client, you provide lots of instruction, exposure is not inherently dangerous or traumatizing. Difficult, yes. Even scary, yes. But those things do not automatically equal trauma, which is another problem we'll talk about in another day. It might for some people because of their background, in which case we might choose to delay or even completely forego exposure work. But be careful about declaring that exposure is structurally cruel or traumatizing because it is difficult and involves feeling sometimes even extreme discomfort. That does not make it dangerous. That's really important. And here's a third criticism, which is not really a criticism. It's more of an observation of sort of the therapy world. Therapists don't like to make clients do scary things. Who would blame them? I don't like doing that either. It's totally understandable. There's no knock there. Therapists and counselors are humans like all of us. Sometimes they are sensitive themselves, or maybe they have a low distress tolerance level personally or professionally or both. And they just simply find the idea of asking somebody to face their fear and feel intentionally uncomfortable. They may find that distasteful. But that may be the case, but we cannot say that that constitutes proof that exposure is cruel or traumatizing or ineffective or not necessary. It's okay for clinicians to choose other modalities for their clients because honestly, sometimes the modalities that we choose and the theories we choose have to be okay with us as clinicians and helpers and therapists before they can even be helpful for the clients that we're working with. But we just can't draw universal conclusions from opinions and emotions and internal experiences of helpers that I think still have the best of intentions, just don't like those therapies. And it's so interesting because when this was studied, and it has been quite a few times, even when therapists are well-trained, counselors are well-trained, and they know and can admit that the data says that an exposure-based approach gives their client the highest odds of achieving a higher sense of well-being and wellness and making improvement, even when they can identify that the data says that this is true, they will still say, but I don't like it because it makes me feel bad to make them feel bad. Again, I can't knock that. That's okay. That's a professional and personal choice. And that's okay. Again, I'm not saying that that person is wrong for doing that. We just have to recognize that that doesn't mean that that is proof 
that exposure is cruel or traumatizing or damaging or somehow doesn't work or is structurally at fault. It's not. But this is kind of where we run into the problems, right? Let's acknowledge first that people don't want to do scary and difficult things. I mean, hell, I don't. Nobody really does when push comes to shove. So if exposure has been proven to be difficult because you're kind of finding it hard to choose to be uncomfortable, that ain't just you. That's pretty much everybody that tries exposure work. I mean everybody. If you find exposure difficult or distasteful in some way, that's not a crime. Now, naturally, it's going to lead you to look for gentler or easier ways to get better. That's not because you're weak or you're flawed or lazy. It's just because you're human. Nobody blames you. I mean, at least I don't blame you for hoping to find a gentle or easy path to wellness. I get it. It's okay. But I've kind of seen the posts and the reels and the messaging about non-exposure recovery. There are wellness frameworks out there that might suggest that exposure isn't needed. And there are even formal manualized treatments that are not based on exposure work. That's totally fine. But sometimes when trying to spread the word about these frameworks or these treatments, it is strongly implied or suggested that no exposure is needed to overcome an anxiety disorder. And that's kind of where I start to look sideways at the whole thing. Now, I'm not picking on the frameworks or the modalities. I'm questioning the use of extreme promises like that maybe to get attention, maybe getting caught up in the excitement, maybe trying to gain, gain credibility for that framework or that treatment, or you know, trying to get engagement in the endless scroll that is social media these days. Are all practitioners trying to fool you with clickbait? No, absolutely, definitely, of course not. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes they get accidentally caught up in the excitement. Maybe sometimes they get caught up in going with messaging that gets most attention algorithmically. Sometimes they're relying heavily on their own personal experience, which they are excited about, and rightly so, they should be, but maybe they fall into the trap of thinking that that personal experience is universal or even widely applicable to other people, which many of us would argue isn't actually a good move. But there are a million reasonable explanations for the recent uptake in the exposure isn't necessary post in our community. We're not here to accuse anyone of wrongdoing or trickery at all. Again, I think people have the best of intentions. The messaging just starts to get a little bit off kilter, and it can lead people down paths where they're promised things that they shouldn't be promised. So I contend here that unless there is some set of ideas or treatment method that has the ability to completely wash away fear, doubt, uncertainty, and discomfort with only cognitive restructuring or spiritual type interventions, there's still going to be exposure involved. Now, that exposure might need to be planned and formal in nature like it would be in traditional exposure therapy, or life is simply going to create exposures, even after all the explanations and podcasts and videos and cognitive restructuring modules. A client, for example, that was able to use the psychoeducation and preparatory part of ERP, exposure and response prevention, to find a little more solid ground from which to resist their compulsions and allow scary thoughts without resorting to soothing rituals, is still doing exposures every time those old thoughts pop up and they feel afraid or unsure or like there is something dangerous or sort of risky afoot. A podcast listener that loves the non-exposure method they found online is still messaging me regularly to ask how they can be sure about not hurting their kids. My comment section sometimes loves the idea of non-exposure recovery, but collectively still can't seem to actually do the things or resist the safety rituals or find ways to stop the scary thoughts, even though all the logic and reason and spirituality in some cases has been presented to them in a feel-good kind of way. Now, do these non-exposure principles and methods have a place in recovery? Of course they do. Even a dyed-in-the-wall exposure-based therapist from the old school is going to engage in psychoeducation and extensive preparation with a client before starting the actual exposures. These principles and methods can be very useful and effective in that phase. There is no doubt I'm a big fan. I am using quite a bit of inferential work with my clients as part of prep, and it's proving to be quite helpful to many of them. How? It helps them understand why even though they still don't really believe it, it might actually be safe to do exposures, and it helps them understand the lessons they can learn from those exposures. I love all that stuff. I really do. I intend to continue to use it because it's actually really helpful. But in the end, all the cognitive or spiritual work ultimately gets put to the test when you come into contact with reality. Your brain is still going to make thoughts, 
just feeling more confident that they aren't dangerous doesn't stop the process. The situations and contexts that you're in are going to trigger longstanding fears sometimes. You're going to be forced to do things that you believed for a long time were impossible or risky. Life is going to force you to test your newfound understanding, air quotes, in real world conditions where you have to actually act and behave rather than just thinking or talking in metaphors or concepts. And when this happens, unless the non-exposure approach has turned off those longstanding beliefs, thoughts, or fears, which I have yet to see happen, you will be in an exposure, like it or not. The need to allow discomfort, to let experience teach the ultimate lesson is still baked into this process. We can't get around it. So, can we engage in prep work and even instruction or coaching that helps people accept to a greater degree that it is in fact safe to allow discomfort or fear so they can learn from that? We can, and we should. It would actually be cruel and unethical to not do that part. But do we have ways to just turn off your thoughts, instantly banish fear, erase doubt and uncertainty, and suddenly see the world in a totally new way just by talking, thinking, and pondering metaphors? It does not appear that we do. Our brains, and the folks in neuroscience are learning more about this every day, our brains are prediction and error correction machines that rely on cognition and experience together to build new schemas and models of the world. Experience alone doesn't cut it, nor does cognition alone. They work together so that in the end we need experiences, and unfortunately sometimes these are still difficult and challenging experiences, to actually change our beliefs, and more importantly, change how we expect our tomorrows to look. So if you've been trying non-exposure recovery and finding that it makes you kind of feel good to hear all the words, but that you're still stuck and you find yourself still looking for ways to not be afraid, not have scary thoughts, or to actually really believe that you're safe before you take action, it's okay. It's not your fault and you're not doing it wrong. You're just like every other human being on the planet and that's okay. Can you recover without exposure? Well, you can do a lot of really helpful non-exposure work that does help you move forward. There is no doubt in my mind about that. But there are always going to be challenges, experiences, and experiments that put your new words and images to the test. And those, like it or not, are still exposures, sometimes challenging ones. That sucks, but it's still okay. So there you go. That's episode 298 of The Anxious Truth in the books. There's no music to let you know it's over, but I'm telling you it's over. I hope I've been able to answer the question about non-exposure recovery, at a minimum to give you things to think about so that you're a little bit more educated consumer of the information and even the help that you're being offered online and on the internet in various circles. It's hard to get around the part where our brains use experience to learn and change and form new pathways and form new models of the world. I just don't see it happening. We haven't yet. And, we, and, and when we ask a large number of people and we look at a large number of people and we compare the data in exposure versus non-exposure based therapies, some of which claim to be around for 30 years and still only have a handful of studies supporting them, we, we have to draw in conclusions that say not that those are worthless, but that they certainly shouldn't be promising that you will get better without ever having to scare, do anything scary or difficult ever again. That's not fair. So if you are listening to this podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or a place where you can leave a rating or a review, maybe leave a five-star rating if you like the podcast. And if you really like the podcast, maybe take a minute and write a review because that helps other people find the podcast and then more people get help, which is why I do this to begin with. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, which is really this week listening on YouTube, since there's no actual video and only a still image, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Maybe thumbs up the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. Aren't I a good influencer telling you to do all these things like they all do? Hit the notification bell so you know when I upload new content. Uh, and if you have a question, leave a comment. It's taking me longer these days, but I do ultimately every couple of weeks circle back through my YouTube comments to try and answer as many as I can. I promise I do that even if it takes me a while to do it. So thank you if you do do that. And however way you hang around, check in, listen to the podcast, watch the videos and support the work that I do. Thank you. I appreciate that. And before we go, I will remind you, as I always do at the end of these episodes, that anything you can do today, anything to open up, explore other options, do something a little bit differently, challenge your, your irrational belief about being unsafe or in danger, 
anything you can do to act a little bit more toward recovery, toward the life you want, and away from the fear that has you restricted and kind of hating the life that you have, every one of those steps, no matter how small they are, counts. Take them. They add up. You're doing okay, even if the steps are small. Be nice to yourself while you do it. Thanks for listening. I will see you next week. Actually, I will see you in two weeks in episode 299, which has no title yet, but it'll be here. Thanks. See ya.